Welcome back to the On The Ball podcast. This is another episode of the greatest podcast there's ever been. I don't know why I've said that last couple of weeks, but I'm just feeling it. So today we are doing a rugby league episode. Not going to be the usual structure of rev- reviewing the round 16 games and previewing the round 17. We'll preview the round 17 ones, but won't be looking specifically at too many of the round 16. We'll just be discussing the general topics of the footy world, really. So unfortunately, there might be a few negative topics. I don't like talking too much about footy in a negative light. I like focusing on the positives, but sometimes some things do have to be addressed. And obviously, one of the main talking points right now is the Dragons COVID breach. Obviously, there was a house party at Paul Bourne's. If you're a rugby league fan, you would have heard of it. If you're not, well, there, there, there you go. So there's 13 players, including Paul Bourne, involved. 12 of them had all have a one-match suspension and are paying pretty big fines ranging from 5K all the way up to 50K. And import like majorly, Paul Vaughan has had his 800K contract terminated immediately. Uh, he's had a previous strike with another scandal. I think he might have had two previous ones, actually. So they've seen this and they've gone, that's too many chances. I think they might have also seen it as an opportunity to uh, maybe get rid of a overpriced contract. But still... Uh, the merit was there, and yeah, they're just absolute idiots for doing it. Really disrespectful. The thing is, I was saying this to my parents. If it was last year when Sydney wasn't really in lockdown, like when they were sort of out of out of it, but the players were still in it because of the bubble, I'd kind of maybe feel a little bit of sympathy, th- thinking like, well, if the general public's allowed to do it, well, I understand why they might be frustrated that they can't do stuff like that. But the, the fact that Sydney's in a genuine lockdown, the general public can't do this, yet these privileged blokes think they, like they're like they invincible and they're not going to get in trouble for this. It's just ridiculous. And Paul Vaughan had a COVID breach, I'm pretty sure, at the end of last season as well. So, yeah, it just shows that they don't really care. Um, they're just arrogant. They don't think um, the law applies to them um, as much as it does to other people. So... Yeah, pretty disgusting act. I have to say, well done to the NRL. I do think the punishments are definitely heavy enough. Uh, A lot of these situations, they often go a bit light. Um, You know, the police only find them $1,000, which I understand because they only treat them like normal people. So it was good that the NRL came over the top and whacked them with some big punishments because, yeah, it's pretty just really selfish act, just really disrespectful. There's um, Ray Hadley went on a bit of a rant last night on NRL 360. He made some good points there. Andrew Voss also went on a rant on his radio um, show. So if you want to go listen to those, they make some really good points about just how disrespectful it is. And, yeah, it's just I would – There's one of the Dragons players has come out and he anonymously said, like, he's just really disappointed and annoyed everyone else. And there's been – the way people are writing about it is if that's, like, a scandalous thing to say. But, like, I would be completely – completely in the same light like they're I think they're coming seventh right now right in that hunt for the top eight and they've shown glimpses this year of being a really good team and these suspensions are over the next three weeks so you could argue that well we're not sure how they'll go in the next three weeks but if they lose these next three games they're probably out of finals contention and you could put it massively down to this so I completely understand why every other player and all the coaching staff and all the fans would be pissed off uh, so not only did they bring the game into, you know, into danger of not going ahead, but um, and it's they've also dragged it through a negative light in the media, which is never a good thing. But they've also genuinely damaged their club's chances of doing well this year. So yeah, just really, really selfish stuff. Really disrespectful. Uh, it's all been said before in the media, so I don't want to crap on about it too much. But yeah, proud of the NRL for actually. Um, giving these guys a big smack um, with some big penalties. I don't know where I stand on the suspensions being across three weeks. I've heard some people say the dogs have to pay theirs in one week. Uh, so why don't these guys get it? I know it would be good to see them all, all miss the same week and they just get absolutely punished. But in Heinz, like if we look at it in four weeks and they've been effective negatively over the next three weeks and they actually lose the next three games, I'd actually rather that punishment because – that'll genuinely alter their season where if they all miss one week, they could the club could sort of just treat it like a bye week and just go, yeah, we're not going to get the two points here, but then we can really have an assault the next weeks where I feel like a three-week suspension 
um, might actually affect them more than just if they all missed the same week. So, and I also do understand that it's like 13 players. There's only 30 players in a roster. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with it. Maybe across the two weeks would have been better, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not against that. Uh, another talking point is that the my talking points are sort of all just randomly ordered. They're not really got anything to do with each other. But I just want to quickly touch on the Melbourne Storm. On Thursday night, they beat the Roosters 46-0 without Nelson of solomona Ryan Pappenhausen, and Harry Grant. Uh, right now, it's looked like a two-horse race all season. I've had them on top of my ladder, and I think I predicted them to win, and I still am confident in that, but it's almost looking like a one-horse race now. Panthers in the last four or five weeks. I, do, I still think when Cleary comes back and origin's over they still might get hot again and get back up to that form but at the moment it's looking very hard for anyone to beat this storm team they can genuinely have close to six or seven of their best 17 out and they don't look like they're missing anyone uh yeah it's just dane like this rooster team is pretty good they're coming sixth and they're a genuine top four chance still and um yeah the melbourne storm just made them look like a beta team everyone was bagging out the tigers the other week but um, yeah, they're basically doing it to any team they come up against right now. So, yeah, huge congrats. We've got to go to Craig Bellamy. I, I remember at the start of 2020 when these new rules came in, everyone was like, oh, the this is the end of Craig Bellamy, Storm of stuff. But, uh, yeah, he's really changed the way he coaches and the way the Melbourne Storm play, and they've become one of the most exciting teams to watch. And their success has definitely, well, it's sort of increased, if anything, so... Yeah, well done to Craig Bellamy, just further stamping his claims to being the best coach of all time. And well done to the playing squad. They're killing it. Uh, something else that happened on the weekend, the Raiders got pumped by the Titans 44-6 in Canberra as well. Um, Canberra were actually favourites going into it, which surprised me. I tipped the Titans and I actually said um, in my predictions last week that that's like my upset of the week and I had them at the line and everything. Um yeah, I just think there's not been a lot of press on it because there's been a lot of other things, talking points has been origin. Now there's this Dragons COVID breach. And my dad believes, because a lot of his friends with a lot of the people in the media, that he doesn't get much attention. But I do think Ricky Stewart's time is up in Canberra. I just think it all seems to have gotten a little bit stale there. They've had a couple good genera- lot generations, but they've had a couple good teams now. I know they made the top eight, you know, I think like 2015, 2016 with that Blake Austin led side. And then the last couple of years, they went within a bee's dick of winning a premiership. They had a really good side. John Bateman, George Williams, Jack Wines in, was in great form. Josh Papali was one of the best players in the comp. But for me now, it just looks like it's got a little bit stale. Not sure if it's all his fault or if it's the player's fault. But at this point, I think Canberra do need a change because at the start of the year, I was very patient with Stuart because I thought last year they started slow and they came good. So I was just assuming that was going to happen this year. But it's round 16 now and you could argue they've actually gotten worse since the first month of the competition, which is hard to believe that's happened. At this stage, they don't actually have too many injuries. They've got Shans out. Uh, but apart from that, they're almost full strength. I know George Williams left um, in the middle of the year and um, left a hole in the salary cap, but... Apart from that, they've still got a very, very good team on paper and they're playing like a bottom four side. I just did my ladder predictions before, uh, which I'll read out in a second. But uh, yeah, I had them finishing at four, in 14 after being a top four team pretty much for two years in a row. So for me, Ricky Stewart's got to go. I know there's a lot of heat on Michael Maguire and some other coaches, but for me, Ricky Stewart's the one in the firing line right now. And I just think, I think everyone would benefit from it uh, obviously not him because he would be unemployed, but um, I just think Canberra need a change. They need to freshen up. They've still got some good players there, so if they brought in a good coach uh, straight away, maybe new, a few quick signings or something like that, they could pretty quickly get straight back into that top four hunt But um, in the coming seasons. But I just think right now, yeah, the Ricky Stewart and this current playing group, something's not right, something's gone wrong, and I think a change needs to happen. And unfortunately... It's easier to change one coach than 17 to 30 players. So for me, Ricky Stewart has to go. And yeah, it's it's sad because I really enjoyed that the last couple of years of the Canberra Raiders team. They were a really exciting team to watch. Uh, the fans got behind them. The whole city of Canberra got behind them. Uh, Ricky Stewart's a legend of the city and of the team. 
But unfortunately for me, a change has to happen and it's got to happen soon. Um, well, at least before the end of the, the before the start of the season, uh, next season for me. Uh, something else that occurred on Sunday afternoon, actually, no, it was Saturday night, what I'm getting confused. Uh, the Knights put on an absolute clinic over the Cowboys, 38 nil, And this was the first time Mitchell Pierce, Kalen Ponga and Jake Clifford all played together. So this is really what the Knights are capable of. We've been expecting it really since the start of the Adam, Adam O'Brien era at the, in the Hunter. And we haven't seen it on too many occasions. They've shown a, a few bright spots here or there, had a couple really good halves, but they've never really put together an 80-minute performance like this. And all of a sudden, they're a contender, not for the premiership, but like they're a genuine chance of top eight. And, you know, the, there's some teams who are inconsistent in that top six right now, um, such as the Roosters, and you wouldn't want to face the Knights, I wouldn't say. Um, with the strike power, they've got their forward packs immense. So... The Knights are definitely going to be one to watch, especially if they get through this origin period un- unharmed and they come out of it with Pierce, Pong and Clifford off the back of the Saifidi boys. Clemmer, Bradman Best comes back from injury. All of a sudden, what's been a pretty poor season for the Knights starts to look like a pretty exciting one coming into September. So, yeah, huge warning shot from the Knights. The Cowboys have been in great form. They had a hideous lead up to that game with their coach going to isolation and all sorts, but uh, yeah, really, really good win from the Knights, especially keeping them to nil. Frizzell's also coming back, I think, in the coming weeks. So, yeah, big result for the Knights and looking forward to see what they can produce in the future. But sadly, the last three things I've mentioned have been big margins, and that's something I'm going to address today. I know the NRL is often a bit of like an alarmist culture as soon as there's one bad round of footy or we're very introspective, I would say, as a as a collective I think AFL and other sports really appreciate their game and I think sometimes we're a little bit critical of the game uh, overcritical actually whether it be the refs the commentators the players just the product in general but right now there is something wrong with the game and that 100% needs to be addressed and I think that comes in the form of the rule changes I know Wayne Bennett's come out and said that not like pinpointing any teams or anything but he's basically said there's just the reason the gaps, the margins are so big is it's just the some of the lower teams in the competition have just made some really, really poor business decisions um, in terms of list management and stuff like that. And I completely agree with that. And I'll talk about it in a, in a little bit more detail in a second. But there is something wrong with the game. It's 100% correct. Uh, even if we look at a game like the Knights versus the Cowboys, these are two evenly based teams going into it. And if you watch, I know I just was, was saying how great the Knights were, but if you watch that game, you would have thought it was 1 versus 16, but realistically, I think it was like 12th versus 11th or something like that. Uh, it's not just when, it, I know, uh, and right now, I think the Storm and Panthers are probably the two best teams I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I know that sounds like some serious exaggeration, but that's true. They're just really incredible teams to watch. Uh, so apart, but it's not just them pumping teams. Every team's pumping teams. Even the Tigers, one of the least in most out of form teams in the competition, have produced a few wallopings. Even the Bulldogs beat the Dragons the other week, like thirty to nil or something. So there does need to be something addressed. If you don't believe me, the statistics are here to back me up. Uh, the amount of games with a margin of over twenty points per round has doubled from around two to two point five, um, from you know like twenty fifteen to twenty nineteen to around four to five games around. So that's over half of the games per round has a margin of over 20 points. So that's like four tries, um, the margin, which is just not a close game at all, not an exciting product. And the average margin in these games in terms of points has essentially doubled. So it's gone from around 10 to 15 points per round, um, per round uh, to 20 to 25. So yeah, just really... It's just not ideal, is it? Um, we want to see close footy. Yes, it's exciting to see a team put on a lot of points. But when it's 66 nil, like it was on Sun on Saturday with Manly versus the Bulldogs, that's not fun for anyone to watch it. Uh, even at points, um, well, I can't really relate to it as a Tigers fan. And uh, I'm a diehard Blues fan, so I never want them to go easy on the Maroons. But there, were, there was times in that Origin series i can't even deny it i'm not saying origin's broken or anything this was just a one-off series but there were times in that game where i was like well this is just a bit boring like it's not really a contest so something else i'm also concerned about um 
the international rugby league rules have generally been pretty conservative compared to the rugby league. So I was doing some research before and I thought the rule changes hadn't come into play for international rugby league. So I was going to be interested to see how the world cup at the end of this year played compared to the NRL and whether the um, product was better or not, but they've actually adapted the rules of international rugby league to the NRL rules. So there will be six agains and all that stuff. And, Unfortunately, I actually think that's going to make International Rugby League a lot less interesting. Uh, might increase the interest in the games like, you know, Samoa versus Fiji or uh, whether it be New Zealand versus Tonga because I think they're at similar level and and there might be like, you know, 30 or games, stuff like that, really high scoring. They might throw the footy around. However, I think the games involving Australia are going to be absolute blowouts. I think... Australia in general, don't get me wrong, there's some talented players in those other sides, but the Australian team has a skill advantage, that's for sure. And so say they're here, they're a little bit better than, you know, New Zealand, Tonga, England. And all these rules have done, we've seen it with the Storm, the Panthers, the Eels, all the good teams this year, it just widens that gap. So all of a sudden, a team can't really grind out a a tough win or a close competitive loss like they used to be able to in defence. Now, if you're the weaker team, it's pretty hard for you to be competitive in the game. So um, I'm really worried about the World Cup. I think Australia might win a lot of games by a lot of points. And they've actually changed the system this year. They used to have a system where all the Tier 1 nations were in the same group to avoid, like, Australia playing, I don't know, Lebanon in the group stage and winning, like, 70-0. But this year they've actually changed that. So Australia will be playing some of the weaker nations uh, so that would be a little bit scary, I have to say, because we don't really want to see Australia winning like 120 nil. Also think Australia have a huge fitness advantage. That's not really something that they should be punished for. Obviously, we want the better, the fitter teams to win, but um, teams like Tonga and England might not be as fit or as athletic as the Australian teams. And um, if they have to defend a couple sets on their line, that I think that they could really become exposed. Now, thinking about how to fix this, a lot of people in the NRL community just complain, 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 but no one really brings solutions to the table. And it's a very tough issue to tackle because these rules were brought in to fix problems at the time. However, they have unfortunately had unintended consequences, as a lot of things do when you change rules or even in like, you know, the economic world, you'll change a policy or something and something unforeseen will happen. But you've still got to be able to make changes to fix those things. unforeseen consequences and we've been talking about it the last few months with my family and I think two of the rules that should change uh one I think they should bring back a scrum for kicking for touch I think this allows the game to have more breaks yes people find it boring especially in the last 10 minutes when a team on top kicks for touch slows the game down gets the um, defense set however I think especially in like the first 60 minutes, I think a lot of times both teams are pretty happy to have a break when the ball goes into touch. I think rarely you see one team rush to a scrum unless there's like a minute left. Uh, So I think both teams wouldn't even mind this. I don't think it would really suit one team or another. Um, And it would just allow the game to stop at the moment. You, You can watch a passage of play. If there's no tries, it can go like 20 minutes without a stop. And these players, they're fit, they're great athletes, but... It's, it's not sustainable to play a sport as intense as rugby league without stoppages. So this needs to come into play. One thing it is, is it also brings in a tactical element of game management, which I actually think is really good. Um, me being like a bit of a test cricket fan and um, a fan of strategic sports like that, I, I don't mind the element of time management. Uh, I think, there's some things that they got rid of in terms of time management, like kicking it dead, that I think they need to stay out of the game because they are boring. But I think kicking for touch, um, I think it's a, a, a very fair way to slow the clock down. Uh, it also helps with the battle of possession. For example, let's look at the Bulldogs. So next year they'll have Matt Burton and Jake Avarillo is also a really good kicker. If they've been tied down to their end and they can produce a really, really big kick, which both of those guys are really um, capable of doing, and they can pin the opposition in their own 30 to 20 metre line with a brilliant touch finder, I think they deserve the opportunity to catch their breath, get their defence set, and see if the other team can break their set defence rather than um, them kicking for touch and the game just going, great kick, but unfortunately they're just coming back twice as fast. So... 
Um, I think that should be a rule that should change. I don't think it will slow the game down much at all, especially when the ball's in play because it only occurs when the ball is out of play. I don't think it happens. I think it happens a lot less than people think. Um, the ball goes over the touch line. Uh, and then something else I want to see is, this one's a pretty drastic change, but I want to see six again calls reserved for only only if a penalty takes place in a team's uh, like for example, if I'm defending my line, my twenty meter, I'm, I'm defending my try line. If there is a penalty committed by the defensive team in within twenty meters of the try line they're defending, I think that's when there should be a set restart. I believe this was the initial intention of the set restart. I think a lot of teams, that's a lot of the stronger teams, what they were doing is they knew their defense was good. So when they were in a little bit of strife in their own 20 meter line, they would hold down a player for long, allow themselves to set their defense and that way they could slow the game down. The team would have to kick for touch and all of a sudden the danger's kind of gone because they just backed themselves to tackle for six tackles. So leaving the six again there stops that from happening, means the team has to defend 10, 12 tackles at a time. However, when a team is, you know, 30 meters out from the opposition try line, I don't think... I don't think a six again call uh, is appropriate. I don't think it's necessary. I think it just allows teams to go up and back way too easy and it stops the bit of a grind that rugby league can get into, which some people will say is boring, but every now and then you need that 10 minutes in a rugby league game. You need tempo. You need, all right, we're just going to grind it out for 10 minutes, get to our fifth tackle kick. Uh, see if we can win the battle of posi- um, field position. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, you know, they're going end-to-end line breaks, throwing the footy. That's the way rugby league has been for centuries. It's been a grind in the middle. It's never been the opposition has to tackle you 18 times in the next minute because you get three set restarts that march you down the field. Uh, I know kicking for touch will also march you down the field, but at least it allows the defence to get a little bit of, br- of a break. They still get punished with a loss of territory and an extra six sets. However, it doesn't completely eliminate their chance of defending pretty much. Uh, And then, so they're my two proposed rule changes that I think would have a drastic effect on the game. I think it would lower the margins, lower the total points slightly. I think it wouldn't really hamper the product. Um, If anything, it would make it more exciting because teams would be, um, have more energy because there's a few more stoppages. Therefore, there's going to be bigger hits, bigger impact, um, stuff like that. And, However, I do have to agree with Wayne Bennett. I think right now we are unfortunately in a time where there's five or six really, really good teams and there's been some teams at the bottom of the ladder for a few years. Not There's no teams that have perennially, perennially been bad except for maybe my own team, the West Tigers, but that is through no fault except their own and some poor luck along the way. However, I do have to say there is an issue in the NRL and I... I'm not sure how you tackle this, to be honest. I think every sport kind of faces it, but for the Bulldogs and the Tigers and teams like that, they often get criticised for their inability to sign good players um, that really change the fortune of the club. And the issue is these players... No, it's not the players' fault. It's not the their team's fault. It's not the agent's fault. It's just the way sport is. So, for example, everyone is saying the Tigers should sign... Dale Finucane or something like that from the Storm. Dale Finucane's a great player. I think he would make a big impact on the Tigers. Wouldn't change the team drastically. However, he would be a huge stepping stone into the right direction for the side. However, the Tigers would have to pay Dale Finucane almost $900,000, I believe, to attract him there. A, because the team is not winning at all. And B, there's just like, like, we're not offering much, unfortunately, as a club. We don't have great facilities, all this stuff. So uh, we've seen in recent years the Bulldogs have probably had to overpay for Nick Kotrick, for Josh Adokar, um, and other players like that. And, yes, they get slandered for these mistakes. But to bring in someone like an Adam Reynolds, like a Dale Finucane, you have to pay close to a million dollars, which, unfortunately, these players are just not worth that much. And the good players, like I know the Morris twins, they were on something like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in their last couple of years to play for the Roosters. They were not that far off Origin selection. They were playing for a team in a top four position, absolute legends of the game. But because they were playing in a winning team, they were happy to take a bit of a salary cut. And unfortunately, 
if they wanted to go to the Tigers or the Bulldogs, they probably would have asked for eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars. So this is something that needs to be stopped. I'm not sure how you do it. That is above my pay grade. This is just a random idea I thought of. There's probably a lot of issues with it, um, and it's sort of just eliminates the free market. But something I was thinking is there could be an independent panel that sets a reserve price for each player. Um, they, this doesn't have to be announced or anything. But what it can prevent is, so say, I don't know, let's say Dale Finucane's, the independent panel um, discusses that Dale Finucane is worth $600,000. And what this would set, what I'm what I'm thinking in my head, I'm not sure if it would work or not, but this is just an idea because I don't want to criticize the game and not produce a solution. What could happen is you could make a bracket where he can go for, so let's say, his reserve price is 600k, so a team can't pay less than 450, and a team can't pay more than 750k to pay this player. This would prevent someone making a fatal mistake that ruins their club for the next five years or something if they pay, wanted to pay him like 1.2 million dollars. It all, it would also limit the advantage of great teams um, getting away with paying these players like 300k because. Right now, and this isn't cheating, this is um, one of the benefits of having a great club with a winning culture, but if you look at the Storm and the Panthers and the Eels and you look at their squad of 30 and compare it to the squads of the Bulldogs and the Tigers, you kind of question how is that on the same salary cap, and it is because players are willing to accept a lot less to play for good teams. So that's just something I could think of. Something else, this is... Uh, oh, the, something else you could think about is compensation for player production. However, I don't think this is really that much of an issue in the NRL. Um, I know the Tigers have produced a fair few players in the recent years and haven't been compensated for them when the big teams come in and pick them up. But unfortunately, that's sort of just the way that sport works. Without the draft, it's very hard to think of any sort of compensation idea because other the way other people do it is they compensate the opposition team with a pick or um, a, a play or something like that so yeah I'm not sure if that's really possible that's also another option and this is sort of the inverse of this so I'm so, kind of contradicting myself but if we really really want to well I don't I'll be honest I don't think this is a really good idea it's been discussed but I don't actually think uh the NRL is that unequal I think there's the top teams and bottom teams fluctuate pretty regularly but you could also do a draft, um, which would see the talent dispersed evenly. But I, once again, I don't think that is too much of an issue. So uh, let me know what you think about some of my opinions there on how to fix the game. This, these changes will be implemented in 2022. I'm not saying the game is in um, a shocking position. I think everyone is panicking a little bit. We've had a couple big blowouts, uh, and I think we've just got a couple really, really good teams this year uh, who play a really, really exciting brand of footy. Uh, so I think we've got to stay patient, but I just think a couple of rule tweaks could go a long way to fixing it. And I think, yeah, to, in my opinion, if you change those two two rules, I think we would pretty quickly return to a great brand of footy that everyone enjoys. So, uh, yeah, let me know what you think. If I'm oversimplifying the matter, if you've got any other suggestions to change rules or if you think the game should be left alone. Uh, moving into my predicted top eight for the NRL it's pretty similar to what it's been in a long for most of the season. I actually did it in a ladder predicted this year, uh, this week. There's only like seven or eight rounds left, so it didn't take me too long. I've still got the Storm on in top. Just think they're way too good. I've got the Panthers in second. Still think they're going to be right in there. And when Cleary comes back from his few weeks off, I think there's going to be a very, very dangerous team again. Uh, I've got the Rabbitohs coming in at third. Just think they've got a soft draw coming home, and they're just a very, very good side. Uh, the Seagulls in fourth, hope, hope, assuming they go injury-free for the rest of the year. Uh, they're just ridiculous right now. They put away almost every team they come up against. I haven't seen them play too many of the top sides since they've hit this run of form. We saw them play the Panthers early on in that, their streak, and I think that's about it. But we'll be interested to see how they go if they come up against some of the big dogs. Got the Eels dropping down to fifth, which is probably controversial, but... Uh, they've got a tough run home. They play some of the big boys again, and I just think that will hurt them in the long run. Got the Roosters in at sixth. Still think they're better than the rest of the competition, but I think they're a little bit off that top five at the moment. Lacking a... Well, I don't want to have a crack at Sam Walker, but they're just lacking some um, experience, some composure, 
in that halves department, and I think it's very noticeable at times. I've got the Knights in at seventh now. I just think they're going to hit a nice run of form on the way home if they get through this Origin week unharmed. I think they should, yeah, I, I just see them coming home with a bit of a wet sail. I've still got the Sharkies in eighth to, despite a disappointing loss to the Broncos. Just on paper, I think their team is one of the best of the teams in contention for that eighth spot. And also, they've been in pretty good form in the last four or five weeks. And they have a track record of making finals. I think they've made the last two or three series. So, I have a bit more favour in them. Uh, the t- teams I just have missing out, I've got the Titans and Dragons on two points less than the Sharkies, finishing in ninth and 10th, respectively. Uh, so, based on that, I think the Dragon suspensions could seriously hurt them. And the Titans' early season inconsistencies... And then four points back from the Sharks, I've got the Warriors, Tigers, and Cowboys all tied up, leaving the bottom three as the Raiders, Broncos, and Bulldogs. So let me know what you think about that. Let me know if there's any changes you'd make. And we will get into our Round 17 preview. Not going to touch on NRL Fantasy this week, um, even though I hardly ever touch on it. I had a decent week uh, this week's bye week, so interesting to see how everyone goes. I think I'm in the top 27K at the moment, so I'm okay with that. Doing a lot better that than on that than my AFL super coach, but uh, there's only four games this week to preview, so it will be pretty short. Manly versus the Raiders. This was a bit of a rivalry a couple of years ago. Um, I remember Dylan Walker. Uh, he did he kick a goal after the siren, something like that. There was some controversial penalty after the siren. He kicked a goal and then he got in the Raiders players, and there was a bit of a scuffle. So who knows? Could see some tempers flare. Um, Dylan Walker is actually playing at number seven. Um, DC and Turbo obviously out for origin purposes. So Garrett goes to fullback. Dylan Walker goes to the seven. Kieran Foran's captain at six. Going to be interesting to see how Manly go. They actually won the game before Origin won when their players missed. They pumped the Cowboys by like 40 or something. So didn't see that one coming, but it'll be interesting to see if they can do it again this week. Raiders themselves are pretty affected by both injuries and origin. They've got Papali, E. White, and Simmonson and Whitehead all missing out. Xavier Savage starts at fullback. Don't know much about him, to be honest, but I saw that one. And Matt Frawley plays at number six. He doesn't get too many chances at the Raiders, but we'll see how he goes. He's usually a pretty steady hand when he plays. Moving into the Rabbitohs and Cowboys, Benji Marshall's been picked to start at the hooker position, which is interesting. He played a little bit of that for the Tigers last year, so that'll be interesting to see how he goes. Taffy is playing fullback, and uh, the fullback for the Cowboys is also Dijan Assi. Not sure how to pronounce that name, but some exciting young talent on show for both teams. Uh, The Rabbitohs, they've got their usual halves, which is going to be a big factor. I'll get into my tips after I run through the team changes. The Bulldogs versus the Roosters. The Bulldogs get their players back from their COVID breach. Unfortunately, not sure how much that will impact this game, but it is a boost for them. Sam Walker's been picked despite some calls for him to be rested for the rest of the season by some experts. Drew Hutchinson has been picked since his first game, since his punctured lung against Parramatta, and Lockie Lamb has been dropped to the bench. Sharks versus the Warriors. Reese Walsh, Cody Nicarima come back in through from injury. Matthew Lodge also makes his debut for the Warriors, starting in the number 10 position. And Tohu Harris and Chad Townsend are out. Sadly for Chad Townsend, he looks to be out for a significant number of weeks um, after only coming to the club last week. So, yeah, a little bit disappointing there. The Warriors are building something, though. Uh, I like the way Phil Gould is obviously a very, very good list manager. So hopefully there's some more of um, the Phil Gould types out there that can sort out some of these poor clubs. But... Uh, moving into my game picks for the round, I've got Manly beating the Raiders by 26 points, which is my sure bet of the week. That will also be um, the only one I'm interested in at the line. The handicap is 13 and a half to the Seagulls. I could be over, I could be underestimating the impact of no turbo and DCE, but I just think I tipped the Cowboys actually last time when the Manly Seagulls were without turbo and they pumped them by 40. So I'm, Going to try and learn from my lessons. And also the Raiders are pretty injury infected themselves. Got the Rabbitohs by 20 over the Cowboys. Just think they've still got their halves. they are still got a lot of good players. Campbell Graham, um, Alex Johnston, stuff like that. Their forward pack's pretty much untouched. So I think they'll be too strong. Cowboys 
They were in decent form in a, around Magic Round early in the season, but they look like their wheels are starting to slow down a little bit. And it looks like, you know, that Todd Payton thing is not, not, not great for them. Uh, Bulldogs versus the Roosters. I've got the Roosters by 18. I could see this one being a little bit closer than people might think. In a normal round, I would say the Roosters by 40-odd, but I think Roosters with no James Tedesco, I think that's a big impact on them. So I could see it being a little bit close. Bulldogs will be looking to respond from their absolute walloping last week. So uh, they might be getting busy. And they were actually in decent form before last week. So that'll be interesting to see. And then game of the round for sure. Sharks versus the Warriors. Huge implications in terms of the battle for 7th and 8th position. Um, the Warriors lost by one point last week. And the Sharkies lost to the Broncos, so it's going to be a big week for both of them. Need a bounce back victory. I'm going to be tipping the Warriors, which is my upset of the week. I've only I've tipped them by one point because I think this is a real toss of the coin. I think the Sharks um, before last week were one of the form teams in the competition outside of you know around that top four spot. However, that last loss last week was really really disappointing, and the Warriors. They're one that doesn't really stay down for too long. If they lose a game one week, they're very, very likely to bounce back for the win the next week. So I trust the Warriors to bounce back. They've got some big ins in Reese Walsh and Nick Arima and Matthew Lodge. Yes, Harris and Townsend are out hurts, but I think the ins outweigh the outs there. And I'm going to say the Warriors pick up an upset at uh, Cobra, I guess it is, Net Strata Jubilee, wherever that is. I always get confused with the Dragon Stadiums. Unfortunately, I think all these, all four of these games are in Sydney, so I don't think there's any crowds at any of them, which is a bit of a shame. It would have, like, I know it was, would have been a very expensive exercise, but it would have been cool if the NRL came down to Melbourne for a couple of weekends and played all the games here. I would have frothed that, but anyway, I understand that is a very costly exercise. So let me know about my predictions. Let me know who you've got in those four games, or if uh, you disagree with any of me, my calls I've made in this episode. Uh, yeah, enjoy the week. Uh, I'll be doing a NRL review, I guess, early next week, and also a bit of a preview for the Origin Series Game 3. Uh, I'll also be having an AFL episode up later in this week. i um, doing that tonight with the boys, so watch out for that one. We'll be hopefully, hopefully putting up some clips as well as I get back into the rhythm of it in, during uni, uh, uni exam holidays, uni holidays. Uh, but yeah, thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed the episode. If you have, leave a like and all that good stuff. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time. Cheers.